welcome to Rock Harbor. Good to see everybody here today. My name is Scott, and it's my privilege to share with you today as we continue on in our series talking about margin. Uh, how do I have or how do I create space for God to move in my life? You know, a few weeks ago, we started this and talked about several different things, but one of them was for many of us, we just continue to run our life to the red line, where it's just going faster and faster. And we think, well, I can add this into my life, or I can add this into my life, or I can add this into my life. And then we do that, and we're like, I am so worn out. I feel like I have no space even for God to move or for me to do what I want to do. And so we started talking about some principles of how we could actually do that and create some of that space. And today we're going to continue on um, with that. Last week we talked about, you know, our primary purpose in, in life is to do life with God and to bring honor and glory to him. And today we're going to talk about how do I bring intentional relationships, intentional friendships into my life to make sure that I'm creating space for God to move in my life. And for many of us, we're so busy with life, we don't actually create time to have those intentional friendships and those intentional relationships. I read a story a few weeks ago about a guy named Sam Davis. And Sam was a 19-year-old. Um, he was actually in the military at war, and um, he wrote a letter to his parents after he had been captured by the Union Army. And this was Sam's words to his parents. He said, dear mom and dad, tomorrow I will be hanged. It's nothing you've done, but I've gotten into some trouble here in the war, and they're going to hang me. Love, Sam. Now, you read a letter like that, and it's like, my goodness, could I imagine receiving a letter like that from someone that I loved, from someone that I cared about? I started asking some questions like, what did Sam do to get into so much trouble? And here's what happened. Um, Sam was, this was during World War II, Sam was, was behind enemy lines. He was a Confederate spy trying to find out what the Union Army was trying to accomplish and what they were trying to do. And as he got past, as he got past a certain place, he realized that there was another guy about his same age that he met, and they became friends, but he was on a different side of the army. And they began talking and became friends and hung out for a little while together. And, and there came a point in time when he said, he said, Sam, you need to go back and you need to go back to your side because we have this war that is going on. He said, but I want to give you something before you do. He said, I want to give you these maps. These are maps of our troop movement. Now, here's the deal, Sam. They're not accurate any longer. They were at one time, but they no longer are. But if you take these maps back to your general, there's a good chance they're going to look at you in a very good light and you may receive a promotion. Sam said, thank you so much. And on his way, he went. And as he began to go back, he was captured by another Union soldier. And he was imprisoned. And they began to ask him questions like, where did you get these maps from? You see, they went through his saddlebags and realized that you have something that you shouldn't have of ours. And we want to know where it came from. And Sam said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. Till finally one day they said, then we're going to kill you. You see those gallows out there, Sam? Those are for you. You see that coffin out there, Sam? That coffin is for you. And they put him on a horse strand wagon and they began to take him to the gallows where he would die. As soon as he got off of the, the horse and the buggy, he got out and a, and a general said to him, he said, what is your name, sir? He said, my name is Sam. He said, Sam, you are accused of having some maps that are ours, and we need to know where they came from. Sam said, I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you that. He said, where did you receive them from? He said, well, I got them from a friend. He said, who's your friend's name? He said, I can't give you my friend's name. The general said, you're not listening to what I'm saying. Sam, you're 19 years old. You have the rest of your life to live your life. But if you don't tell us where you got these maps from, you're going to die. Sam said, I'm sorry, sir. I can't tell you that. He said, yes, you can. And they began to lead him towards the gallows. And he said, I'm going to give you one last chance. Sam, where did you receive these, these maps? And this is what he said to the general. He said, sir, I'd rather die a thousand deaths before I deny my friend. And I'm disappointed in the fact that you even asked me who my friend was. Because he was a true friend. Isn't that the kind of friend that all of us long to have? Someone who would be there for us and have our back no matter what is going on in this world and in this life. But in our culture and in our context today, true friendships, they don't come easy any longer. For many of us, we have our family and we have maybe just one or two people that we call a friend and they're probably related to us. We don't have a bunch of people or a list of people in our life that we go, these are my people. They would be here for me in the good, in the bad, in the ugly they would be there for me, and they would never, ever, ever talk bad about me. They would always have my back. They would even cover my 
weaknesses. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have very many friends like that? In your program today, there's five lines, and I'm going to ask you just, we're going to take 10 seconds out of our our time today, and I want you to write down, are there five people in your life who you would say, Scott, these are my people. They're on my list. If something was happening in my life, I know they'd have my back. I know they'd be there for me. They would never talk behind my back. They would have my back. They would cover my weaknesses, and they would brag on the things that I do good. Write down just five for me, if you would. Let's take 10 seconds starting right now. This week, I started writing my list as I was writing through this. And I'm like, how many, how many people do I have in my life like that? And I got to like four. I couldn't get to five. If you have five, that's amazing. You are a very wealthy, rich person in friendship. Maybe for some of us, we didn't have four. Maybe we didn't even have three. Maybe we didn't have two. Maybe we didn't even have one. See, that's not the way that God designed for you and for me to live. He didn't design for us to live in, in, in this state, a state of loneliness. That's not what God wants for you. And there's a lot of different reasons why that has happened. In 1985, a study was done on, on how many people have those kinds of friendship. And this is what it came back with. That there were, the average person in 1985 had three people like that in their life. 20 years later, the same study was done, and, the, and it came back that the average is two people in your life like that. Today, if it was done today, I, I think it probably would be even less than two You see, we have all these different reasons of people that we think are friends, when in reality, they really aren't. They're just acquaintances. And why does this happen? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is we move around so much more than we ever did before. The average American moves 14 times in their lifetime. For many of us, maybe we're newer to the area, and we're trying to reestablish all these friendships all over again. That can be a really difficult thing to do because we're looking for our people We're looking for people that we connect with, people that we relate with, people that we can share life with, but we're not finding it maybe like we would like to. Another reason is because we just don't have the time. I mean, we're like more busy than ever before today. You know, growing up, you have your stuff going on as a kid, and then later on in life, you go through college, or maybe you go to a trade school, you figure out your career, maybe you have a family. It's like, man, life is just churning all the time, and it's never slowing down. We feel like, I don't have time to have those kind of relationships. Maybe it's because of social media. I'm not going to harp on social media today. I did enough last week. I'm not going to do that again. Um, but we, we think, well, man, I've got 1,000 friends on Facebook. We're like super close. We're like, we're tight, right? I mean, it's like I see what they ate for dinner last night. It's awesome. It's my people. We're close. And we don't connect maybe like we should. Maybe another reason is because we've been burnt by enough people that we're not willing to open up and be honest with people any longer. Because you're like, man, I tried that once, Scott, and I got hurt really bad. I'm not really, not really wanting to do that over again. And for many of us, we're so lonely. Gallup did a, did a survey not long ago, and they talked about how many people feel lonely in the U.S. today. And they found that four out of ten, four out of ten Americans felt like, I'm lonely today. I don't have these kind of deep relationships. What that means is, is that 40% of the people that you and I lock eyes with, they're lonely today. They don't feel connected. And we say it around this place all the time, that circles are better than what? Rows. Rows. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Let's try it one more time. Circles are better than rows. rows. Here's the thing. Rows, they can bring isolation because we just sit and we listen. Circles, they bring intentionality. They bring this idea that we're going to do something with other people together. And God created you and he created me for relationship. He wants that for you. He wants that for me. And matter of fact, that's kind of how he starts out in Genesis chapter two. It's exactly what God says. God looked down at all the men on earth and he thought, I can't leave those dudes alone. I can't do that. Look at what he says in Genesis two, verse number 18. It says, and God saw the loneliness in creation. The Bible says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Can you imagine what this world would be like if it was just full of just men and no women? Why do you giggle? I mean, that's a scary thought. Could you imagine? I can't even imagine. I can't even say that. Um, there's so many things I can't even think about. I mean, God looked down, and he said, 
it's not good that man should be alone. So he created somebody else to help him. And all the guys said, man, three of you are going to have a good lunch today. (laughs) The rest of you, I'm sorry. Um, I gave you the opportunity. It was pretty simple. You failed. God said, it's not good for us to be alone. God doesn't want you to feel lonely. If that statistic is true, that means 40% of the people who are here in this room, who are watching at the Hub, who are watching online right now, are lonely. 40% of the people we lock eyes with, they're not feeling accepted. They're not feeling loved. The two greatest needs that all of us want is to be accepted and to be loved for who we are and to have true friends. Every one of us, we want that. And God said, I created somebody to help you through this because it's not good for you to be alone. So God provided a help meet for him. You know, when we think about Jesus coming to this earth, what's the first thing that he did? One of the first parts of his ministry was he began to teach, and then he gathered around himself 12 guys who he began to do life with. 12 dudes. Peter, James, he said, I'm going to try to help you guys figure out what this life is all about. And when you began to look at their lives, you realized that they were not like the all-star, all-out, live-their-life-right kind of guys. They were a bunch of ragtag guys that were pretty rough. They weren't real, weren't real smart, some of them. And they were just kind of living life on their own and for themselves. And Jesus said, I'm going to do something in them that they could never do on their own. I mean, think about what Jesus must have went through with some of these guys. One of the things we read in scripture is that they argued all the time about who was the greatest among themselves. I mean, Jesus is sitting there and listening to them, right? Oh, you think you're better than this person. Oh, you think you're better than this person. Oh, you think you're better than this person. And Jesus just sits and he listens to them. They begin to argue about everything. Then Jesus would have to explain things over and over and over and over again to them. Like, this is what I want you to do. Yeah, but why should we do that? I mean, I don't understand what you're saying. One of the most difficult things for some people, not me, um, because I'm super patient, but some people is to explain something to someone, like, very well, and then go, so how do I do that again? You're like, oh, my goodness. We just explained this. I thought it was simple. I thought I did a good job explaining it. Obviously, I didn't. I'm awful, right? It has to be me. It couldn't be you. And then he would explain himself again and again. And again to these guys. And they would argue. And they would fight. And Jesus is saying, I'm just trying to help you understand what I want you to do. They didn't keep their promises. They said, hey, no matter what, we're with you, Jesus, to the very end. But when the rubber met the road, those dudes tucked tailed and run as fast as they possibly could. They knew it was going to happen to Jesus, and they didn't want to have any part of it. You think about Thomas. Thomas doubted. He didn't believe that Jesus actually went through all of this. You think about Judas Iscariot. He was a liar and a thief. He was not a good guy. You think about Levi. Levi was a tax collector. Anybody enjoy paying taxes today? Moving on. I mean, none of us enjoy that. He was a tax collector. Nobody wanted to be around that guy. And then Peter, he couldn't help but put his foot in his mouth over and over and over again. Have you ever been around someone who had no filter? It's like, you have no filter. You just talk without thinking. You should really think before you talk. That would be very helpful for you and for me. Some of you are smiling because you are that person, right? Or you know that person. Or maybe because you want to be that person. I I don't know what it is, but he just would talk and say stuff. That's what Peter did. He would just say stuff. It's like, what are you saying that for? Just be quiet. But he couldn't help himself. The Bible tells us that, man, this is what these guys did. And then Jesus said to them, here's what I want you to do. I want you guys who are rough, ragtag dudes who don't have it all figured out, I want to give you a new commandment. This is what I want you guys to do. I want you to love like nobody has ever seen somebody love before. In John 13, 34, this is what the Bible says. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Before you're to love God, right? Now I want you to love God one another. And in verse 35, he goes on and tells them, this is how people will know you're my disciples, by how you love other people. How do you love other people? He says in verse 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. It's very simple what Jesus wants us to do. 
It's not difficult at all. It's actually quite simple. Just love God and love people. That's, that's it. And what did Jesus model? He modeled what it meant to be in a, to a, a small group or a community group. I've had people ask me many times in my life, Scott, do you think community groups are really that important? I mean, are they really that important? We say it here, it's the one-two punch. We want to have a great weekend experience. We want to have a stellar discipleship pathway and understand who God is in our life and how we're growing in our relationship with him. Are we truly becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus? Yes, it's important. Jesus spent the majority of his earthly ministry with 12 people. And I always say it like this, if it was good enough for Jesus... And I'm just going to go with what he said. I'm going to go with what Jesus said. If he said, this is what you should do, I think that's probably the direction for us to go. For most of us, we look at it, we go, you know what, Scott? I just don't have the time to be involved in a group. Here's the thing. We're going to walk out of here in just a few minutes. Every single one of us has an opportunity to sign up to be in a group. And we have all different types of groups. Do you know why? Because we're all at different places in life. For some of us, we need to have a singles group. For some of us, we need to have a young adult group. Our high schoolers, they have their groups on Sunday nights. Our middle schoolers, they have groups on, on Sunday mornings. We have married couples groups. We have financial, financial peace groups because some of us are struggling in our finances. We have, we have groups that are, that are really centered around pornography because we're like, this is a struggle for me. Or we have a ladies group called Betrayal and Beyond that's for ladies who maybe they've been betrayed and they're needing help to walk through this. We have groups that are there called grief share because we've been through a tough experience or a tough lifetime. And it's like, what do I do with the grief that I have in my life right now? You see, we have all different types of groups. You know why? Because we're all at different places. And we can come up with all the excuses we want to come up with of why I can't get into a group. But what they are is just simply excuses. It's us saying, what can I cut out of my life to put something intentional into my life? That's what God desires for every single one of us. Jesus looked at those 12 guys and he said, here's what I want for you. I want you to learn to love and be the most loving group of people in the whole wide world. Why? Because we need to be accepted and we need to be loved. And that's what God wants for us. Circles are better than what? Rows. We know it. It's easy to see, but are we creating the time and place for this? Jesus went on in the book of Acts in chapter 2, and this is when the church, the local church, was very first formed. In Acts 2 and verse 42, it says, this is how they actually did ministry. This is what God wants for you and for me. And it's a very familiar, for your tech, familiar text to us. And, and here's the thing. At the time, there were about 200,000 people attending this church. About half the city was going to this church. Do you know why they were going? Because they wanted to find a place where they were loved and they were accepted. In Acts 2, this is what it says. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. And to the breaking of bread, that's eating together. We like that part. And, and prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing all the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, they attended the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with good and generous hearts. From the very beginning of the local church, this is what we see them doing. And here's the thing about this. People think, well, did Rock Harbor come up with community groups? No, no wasn't our idea. Um, it was Jesus's idea, and it's what he established the church with. And so we just go with that, right? It's about the one another. You know, our mission statement is to love and lead one another to be devoted followers of Jesus. Where did the one another come from? It came from John 13, 34, and 35. We shouldn't be doing life on our own or alone, God says, I want you to do this with one another. And here's what we see. The first point is this. They understood and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. They got serious about God's word and about praying. And in America today, this is something that I don't know that we spend as much time on this as we possibly should. You see, for most of us, we have a Bible that we can open any time we desire. I read a story many years ago about a, a missionary named Robert Evans who was going to uh, the greater European, or he was going to, to Poland to share the gospel. And in his book, he writes this about a story of him going and sharing the gospel in this village of people. It was just after World War II, and, and he was explaining to them what, what actually happened and took place during this time. He said, we got there, and I began just to go to the town hall and began to share the gospel. And he didn't know what was going to happen. This is what he wrote. He said, that night while we were preaching, uh, the, power of saving, the power to save of the Lord Jesus Christ, hundreds of decisions were made for him. 
He said it was apparent that these were just simple, country-minded folk who had never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. He said time after time, the building was emptied, and then it would be refilled. And for six and one half hours, his interpreters and him just shared the gospel over and over and over again. And by the end of the night, they were tired. They were worn out. And he said we were going to leave. He said we walked out after our last session, and there was a crowd that so far that I couldn't even see it. There were people everywhere just waiting to hear what he had to share. You see, people had went back to their homes, and they said, hey, you need to go to the town hall. You need to hear what this man has to say about Jesus. He said, and I stood there, and I looked out at the sea of people, and I, I knew I had no choice. I had to share the message one more time. And he began to share the message of Jesus. There were people who were weeping, understanding who Jesus was. He said, but there was one 80-year-old man who clung to him as he was walking through the crowd, and he continued to, to pull on his coat. The old man was persistent, he says. He was wrinkled, shriveled, had bowed legs, and was down with age. He hung onto him as they were going through the jostling crowd, talking excitedly for a while. And finally, his Russian interpreter, he said, do you hear what he's saying? He said, no, what is he saying to me? He said, well, he has a piece of paper that he thinks, he thinks might be a page from the word of God, but he's not sure. He said, well, have him open it up and take it out. And the man very gingerly began to take this piece of paper out of his pocket. He began to open it up. It was yellow because of age. It had been tattered because of how much it had been handled. And he began to read it. And he realized exactly where it was from, Exodus. And he looked at the man and he said, yes, that is a page from the word of God. The 80-year-old man began to shake with excitement. He said, I've read this my whole life. And I've always wondered if it was the word of God because it was so different than anything I had ever read before. What I've longed for is to know what's on the next page. Robert opened his Bible. He showed him the page in his Bible that he had had for all those years. And he showed him the next page and the next page and the next page. And then he took his Bible and he gave it to the 80-year-old man. You know, as I sat in my office this week, and I was writing part of this, I looked up at my office shelf, and there must be 10, 15 Bibles sitting up on a bookshelf, many of, many of which I haven't opened in years. Some of them I had when I was just a young Christian, when I was just understanding who Jesus was. This man had waited for 80 years to hold the whole copy of the Word of God in his hands. I felt so convicted. Do I really treasure Scripture? like that 80-year-old man. You see, for most of us, we walk around and we have many Bibles, or we have it on our phone, or we have it on our iPad, or we have a physical copy of it, and we take it, but do we actually open it, and do we actually read it? This 80-year-old man, he, he, just, he just wanted to spend time in the Word of God. Do we really treasure it? The next thing they did was they began praying like they'd never prayed before. They began praying big prayers, prayers like, God, search me. Search my heart, O Lord, for you're the only one who can actually know my heart. The Bible says in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And if, you see, be, if, you, if there be any grievous way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. Father, if there's anything in my heart that's keeping me from you, God, please remove that. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, that the Lord can't even hear me. If I don't confess my sin to him and say, God, I, I, I want you to search me. Lord, this is what I've done that I know is wrong. I have sinned against you. The Bible says God can't even hear us. When was the last time that we just stopped and said, God, please forgive me for this sin. God, please forgive me for my wrong that I have done in my life. Maybe the way I've wronged a friend, I've wronged a spouse. Maybe the way I've wronged a coworker. Maybe the way I've wronged my company. Maybe the way I've wronged somebody who's an employee. God, search me and know my heart. Second thing they prayed is, God, lead me. Psalms 25.5 says, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God and you are my salvation. For you, I will wait all the day long. Lord, Lead me the right way. I don't want to lead my life myself. I've done that before. It didn't work out like it was supposed to. God, I'm not in charge of my life. God, search me. God, lead me. The third prayer is, God, use me. God, use me. Use me to do what only you can do. When was the last time we prayed that? 
The prophet Isaiah, he prayed this, and I heard a verse of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go? Then I said, here am I, Lord, send me. I'll do your work. Father, I'll do whatever it is you're calling me to do. For many of us, we have no margin in our life, so we can't even pray that. We're like, God, I would do it, but I don't have enough time in my life to do what you're asking me to do. And it's because we've allowed other things to creep into our life that have busied us with a lesser cause. God's saying, I, I, I want to search you. I, I want to lead you. I, I want to use you. But you have to create some margin in order for that to happen. And that's what God wants for every single one of us, is just to say, I, I can't do this on my own any longer. We think about the second thing is, is that they, they, we know, find they love each other deeply. They genuinely cared about each other. The Bible says, and they, all the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They, they enjoyed just spending time together. Then it goes on, it says, they sold their possessions, and they helped one another out as they saw fit and as they needed to. Do we enjoy spending time with God's people? Like just talking about life. You see, for some of us, it's really easy to get involved in conversations about what's happening with the weather Hey, man, the snow's been amazing up in the mountains here lately. Man, I've got some great runs in. It's been really, really good. Hey, man, I got a new car, or this happened at work. And we talk about surface issues, and we don't talk about things that really, really matter. The real relationship side of things, it's not what it once was. Because we filled so much stuff in our life that we don't actually fill it with the things that God desires for us to. God's saying, will you create space for me? We create space for me through some kind of a group that I want you to have in your life. The third thing we find is they rallied around each other and they sacrificed for one another. The Bible says that they sold their possessions, not for themselves, but they began asking, what can I do to help somebody else out? They realized that life wasn't about them anymore. Life's not about us. It's not about what I can have. And we realized that they sacrificed like never before so that other people could have something else. That's what God wants for us is to get to the point where we're, we're willing to sacrifice and say, God, I'll, I'll do whatever it is you desire for me to do. Or whatever that looks like, I, I, I'm down for that. If that's what you want, then that's what I want to do. I mean, I think about the sacrifice that happens in our own heart, in our own life. There are many people in this room, I know you have sacrificed greatly. You know, when I drive down Chinden and I'm going down Chinden heading west and I see that, that metal and the steel and the building that's being erected over there, and I go, man, there are many people who go to Rock Harbor who call Rock Harbor home that they've given sacrificially so that project can actually take place. You've said, I'll do whatever it takes. It's not about me. It's not about me having one more thing or one more possession. It's about realizing that there really is a heaven. There really is a hell. People really are gonna live one place or the other, and what on this earth are we gonna do about it? I'm like, what are we gonna do about it? And I know many of you, like me, we've... We just want to put a building over there so we have a permanent place. Why? So we can have a building? No. So we have a place where people can find and follow Jesus. That's really all it comes down to. It's just metal. It's just wood. It's just electrical. It doesn't matter this side of heaven. The only thing that's good about it is that people will hear the life-changing message of Jesus. That's what it's all about. And you've given sacrificially to say, yes, we want to see that happen. We want to say thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Because we could never do that on our own. You see, this is the kind of people that they were at that time. They were willing to sacrifice. They prayed big prayers. God, search me. God, use me. God, lead me. I want you to do whatever it is that you possibly could. And I believe there are people who come in here every single week that you have things going on in your heart. You have things going on in your life. And I'll read the prayer request on Monday as they come in from Sunday and begin to pray for those prayer requests and think about this is what's going on in their life. This is what's actually happening in their life. God, please be with them. But there's some prayer requests that I read and I go, what if they would have come to us and had a conversation beforehand? Pete Wilson writes in his book about this, about, about people who are struggling. He says, you know, we hear about divorce, but what if we heard about the problems that were going on in the marriage long before the divorce actually took place? Maybe then we could have helped. We hear about, about issues that are going on with, with, with suicide. What if we would have actually had a conversation with someone before they actually got to that place? We hear conversations about a kid who runs away from home. What if we heard about the conversation of things that were going on in the home that led up to that child running away from home? We would love to have a conversation about that and to pray with you about that and just to say, what could God do if we allowed him to come into the mix? 
But so often, we hear about those things long after they've happened, and we can't be on the offensive side of it. We're on the defensive side of it. And that's not the way that God wants it. But see, we live in this lonely, broken world where we're afraid to share what's actually happening in our lives. I love what Galatians 6.1 says. It says, brothers, if anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in, sp- in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be too tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. He says that we are to bear one another's burdens. But how do we do that? You see, it doesn't happen in rows. It happens in community. I shared a few months ago part of our story and part of things that were going on in our life that I never had shared before. And I've had more conversations around that than I ever imagined that I would have. And one of the questions that's come up to me over and over and over again has been this. Scott, how did you get through that time when you were walking it out? I said, it's a great question. At that time, I had seven guys around me who I was doing life with. We were sharing everything together. Month one looked like this. I shared my story, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything, completely transparent and authentic, and said, I'm broken. I I can't do all this on my own. Month two was a group of guys, seven of them, six of them, sharing their story, sharing what was happening in their life and had happened to their life. And it was so intense at some points that, that actually there was a couple of them that had to write everything out and they had to share it with their wife because they hadn't shared everything with their wife at that point. And it was the most authentic and transparent group I have ever been a part of. And transparency and authenticity are two very different things. Transparency is sharing a little bit about what's going on in your life. Trans- authenticity is sharing everything that's going on in your life and inviting some people in to come in and help you with it. And for most of us, we never get to that point. We never get to the point where we can be so open, so honest, so vulnerable, that we invite other people into our life to be able to share our life with us and encourage us. The other night I got together with a couple of them. We were talking about the group that we had had. And one of them said this. He said, Scott, he said, I don't know how you're going to do another group like this because you're not going to be able to share your low about your son every single month any longer. I said, you're a jerk. No, I didn't say that. I said, you're right. Because now that will be my high. You see, every month we would, we would share a low, we'd share our lows, we'd share our highs. We read a book together, we memorized scripture together, we opened scripture together, and we talked about real life. For most of us in this room, that's a scary thought. To share what's actually really happening in our life with somebody else. Because we don't want to be that open. We don't want to be that transparent. We don't want to be that authentic. That's exactly what the early church modeled. They went home to home. They broke bread together. They sold all their possessions. And they were there for one another. And they had each other's back at any cost. And Jesus wants the same exact thing for you and for me today. But the choice is up to us. Will we open up our hearts Will we open up our life enough together? Will we bear one another's burdens the way that Jesus is instructed to and the way that he modeled himself when he hung out with 12 ragtag guys? We're going to walk out of here in just a moment, and you have a choice to make. Will I enter into that kind of a group or not? Let me shift it a little bit. For some of us, we've been coming to church for a long time. We've been in groups for a long time. We've gotten comfortable in those groups. And there comes a point in time when we have to ask the question, when will my role shift from being an attender to a leader? You see, we have new people coming into our church all the time. And all of us are looking for that same connection of being accepted and being loved. And maybe it's time for us to turn from being an attender and just enjoying it to being a leader and providing that opportunity for somebody else. You're like, whoa, Scott, that's kind of a plot twist. I don't really appreciate that a whole lot. I get it. It's not easy. But it's what God has called us to. It's us standing in the gap, saying, God, I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. It's that prayer, God, search me. God, lead me. Now we're praying, God, use me. God wants to use you. 
in a great and a mighty way. But it's up to you. What will we say to that question today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, God, your word. God, it's so rich. We think about Acts 2 and how the church has continued to grow and blossom and multiply. How that was your plan all along. And then we look at where we are today, 2,000 years later, sitting in a church. God, that's our same desire. God, may we continue to grow closer to you. God, may we continue to multiply. God, may we continue to see the impact of your kingdom be had here on this earth, even in Meridian, Idaho, and the surrounding areas, and all around the world. Father, that is our prayer today. Father, we love you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.